It's my pleasure today to introduce our speaker, Dr. Robert Bast. Dr. Bast is a professor of medicine in the Department of Experimental Therapeutics in the Division of Cancer Medicine at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. Uh, he also serves as Vice President for Translational Research. Dr. Bast is well known in the ovarian cancer field for developing the OC125 monoclonal antibody in 1981. This led to the production of a CA125 radioimmunoassay, the first useful biomarker for monitoring the course of patients with epithelial ovarian cancer. Still today, almost 40 years later, CA125 is the best biomarker for ovarian cancer. In this regard, he's a great collaborator and very generous in supplying biospecimens for others like myself to use in biomarker discovery and validation. Dr. Bast is an author of over 500 peer-reviewed manuscripts and 145 book chapters, in addition to invited articles, editorials, abstracts, and books. He's received numerous awards for the, his work and has mentored hundreds of postdocs, medical students, residents, fellows, and faculty. When I told him that he'd be speaking today to pathologists, he promised he'd include at least one H&E or IHC slide, so pay attention for that one slide. Um, his lecture today is entitled, Early Detection of Ovarian Cancer, an Update. Thank you, Dr. Bath. Amy, thank you so much. It's a real pleasure to be here. Actually, I, when I was in medical school, I took out two years to work in Ben Castleman's pathology department, uh, doing just enough pathology to be dangerous. But it, it really has changed how I looked at things over, over the years, and I've always been really sympathetic to, to working with pathologists. This morning, I'd like to update uh, for you early detection of ovarian cancer and the progress we've made. Uh, I do get uh, royalties for CA125 uh, from Fujiribio Diagnostics. Ovarian cancer, uh, when limited to the ovaries, can be cured in up to 90% of patients with currently available therapy, whereas disease that spread from the pelvis can be cured in only 20% or less. And currently, only 20% of ovarian cancers are currently diagnosed in stage 1, uh, limited to the ovaries, or stage 2, uh, spread to the pelvis, but not further. Uh, detection of preclinical disease at an earlier stage, uh, computer analysis suggests uh, could improve survival by 10 to 30 percent. And although we're making real progress on the therapeutics for ovarian cancer, nothing we're doing on the therapy side could possibly achieve 10 to 30 percent reduction in mortality. The requirements for screening, however, are strict. Uh, given the postmenopausal prevalence of ovarian cancer of 1 in 2,500, to achieve a positive predictive value of 10 percent, that means 10 operations for each case of ovarian cancer detected. You need high sensitivity uh, on the order of 75% for asymptomatic uh, early stage disease, but you also need extraordinarily high specificity of 98.6% uh, uh, to avoid alarming people that do not have ovarian cancer, uh, doing diagnostic tests that they don't need and possibly even undertaking surgery that's not necessary. There have been two basic approaches over the years to early detection. One is to use ultrasound, transvaginal ultrasound in recent years. The other is to use blood tests, and the most uh, extensively studied is CA125. Perhaps the most promising approach has used two stages, where a rising uh, biomarker in the bloodstream triggers ultrasound, and ultrasound in turn uh, triggers uh, surgery. Transvaginal sonography, uh, is remarkably good at imaging ovaries, but not fallopian tubes. With It perhaps is too good in that you find abnormalities in the morphology of ovaries that you can't be sure are benign, and consequently the specificity of ultrasound leaves something to be desired. CA125 uh, is a, a molecule that's now been studied in some depth. It uh, was cloned uh, by Ken Lloyd's group uh, and also by the O'Brien team. Uh, this is a very large molecule uh, that extends uh, with an intracellular domain, a membrane spanning domain, and an extracellular domain that's heavily glycosylated with multiple uh, 40K, uh, 60 or more 40KD repeats. This is cleaved just above the cell membrane, and it's this moiety really that floats free in body fluids and in the bloodstream. 
This gives you an idea of just how large CA125 is. If this is the EGF receptor on the cell surface, uh, MUC1, MUC4, and MUC16. And although there can be some variation in size, it's anywhere from 2.5 to 5 million Daltons uh, in size. This is expressed in some normal tissue. It's not utterly tumor specific by any means. It's found in normal fallopian tube, endometrium, uh, lung, and even a bit in the cornea. It is expressed by more than 80% of ovarian cancers. It's transcriptionally regulated, uh, rarely amplified. It's required for adhesion and invasion, uh, and it uh, binds to mesothelin. It's likely the first point of contact between an ovarian cancer cell freeing, floating free in the peritoneal cavity uh, and the peritoneal surface. Uh, here you can uh, see the uh, CA125 on the surface of the uh, ovarian cancer cell, uh, which can uh, bind uh, to mesothelin uh, and the cell can uh, further uh, invade. The normal function of CA125 uh, is not known. As a huge molecule, a substantial amount of ATP and GTP must be required to produce it. Um, CA125 is found in seminal fluid in the endometrium, consistent with a role in reproduction. Uh, mice also express MUC16 and provide a model uh, for its normal function. Uh, with a graduate student at MD Anderson several years ago, uh, we had actually created uh, knockout mice for MUC16, and uh, to our surprise, they really did not have a phenotype. Uh, you could, uh, this distribution of CA125 in female mice resembles that in normal women. Uh, the reproduction and pulmonary function are sufficiently important, however, that you might imagine that just uh, not just one mucin would be provided uh, during evolution, but multiple mucins. But with knocking out both MUC1 and MUC16, we still didn't see an effect on reproduction or, or survival. Although aging uh, MUC16 knockouts uh, have additional lymphomas and also some uh, defects in natural killer function have been described by other investigators. There have been a number of clinical applications of CA125. Certainly monitoring response to therapy was its original purpose. Uh, we've also used this for detecting recurrent disease uh, and in identifying patients with a pelvic mass who would benefit from referral to gynecologic oncologists. As many of the GYN people here know, uh, only about 50% of women with ovarian cancer are actually operated on by gynecologic oncologists who are specifically trained to remove all the cancer if possible. Uh, there are two assays that have been developed, one uh, ROMA with CA125 and HE4, and, one, and the OVA, OVA1 or OVIRA assay that has uh, some five biomarkers, including CA125 and HE4. And these will tell you with pretty great accuracy who is likely to have ovarian cancer and who ought to be referred to a gynecologic oncologist. The real problem is actually using these tests. But this morning I want to talk more about uh, early detection. If you look at the values of CA125 uh, over a period of years in patients who had benign disease uh, or patients who had ovarian cancer, you find that patients with benign disease may have very high levels of CA125, but they don't change. And that makes sense because benign tumors by and large don't grow very much. They don't shed more antigen. By contrast, uh, ovarian cancers growing progressively shed more and more antigen as the mass of the tumor increases, and consequently the CA125 rises. Steve Skates uh, at the Mass General Hospital had developed an algorithm to determine how much of a rise in CA125 should be a concern. Uh, and using this algorithm, uh, our group and others have looked at uh, the uh, early detection of ovarian cancer in a two-stage strategy. In this, women uh, who are over the age of 50 uh, at average risk for ovarian cancer obtain an annual CA125, uh, and that's analyzed by the risk of ovarian cancer algorithm. If there's been no change, uh, they return in a year. If there's been a marked increase, uh, they go on to ultrasound immediately uh, and to surgery if the ultrasound is abnormal. If it's somewhere in between, and this is where this protocol differs from the other clinical studies that have been done, patients come back in three months, the CA125 test is repeated. Uh, if it's unchanged, they come back in a year. If it's gone up, uh, they obtain an ultrasound and surgery. Uh, with Karen Liu uh, at MD Anderson, we've conducted over the last 19 years a screen, screening study, the Normal Risk Ovarian Screening Study, study or NROS. 
Uh, we have uh, 11 sites uh, over the country. Uh, the lowest, I guess the closest one uh, here is Des Moines. But uh, over the last 18 years, so some 36,000 uh, samples have been obtained from more than uh, 6,800 uh, women who participated in the study. Uh, less than 1% have been referred for ultrasound after each annual screening and, and 3% over multiple years on the study. Overall, some 24 operations have been uh, performed based on the algorithm. They've detected 15 cases of ovarian cancer. Uh, two are borderline, 13 were invasive, and uh, 10 of the 15, or two-thirds, uh, were in stage one or stage two. So and that contrasts with the 20% or so that you'd expect by conventional <laughs> diagnosis. Importantly, no more than three operations will be required to detect each case of ovarian cancer using this strategy. Uh, I think mo most people would say that a single one-off CA-125 is neither specific nor sensitive enough to be much help. But this suggests that using CA-125 this way, it is sufficiently specific. We've missed two borderline uh, cases in stage one and three invasive cases in uh, stage one and three. If you look at the pattern of CA-125 uh, in this study, uh, there are cases where CA-125 abruptly goes up over the course of a year. There are, however, other instances where CA-125 gradually increases over a period of years. And in this regard, this is below the 35 units per ml, which is the standard cutoff. And you can imagine an increase in sensitivity as well as specificity. There is a much larger trial uh, that's been conducted in the UK. Uh, this involves some 200,000 postmenopausal women at average risk uh, who've been randomized to three groups uh, over some 14 years. There are about 100,000 controls, uh, 50,000 women who got ultrasound each year for seven years, and another 50,000 women who had annual CA-125 using the RSC algorithm exactly as we did in the NROS study in the United States. With the algorithm, importantly, only three to four operations would be required for each case to detect each case of ovarian cancer. Overall, about 40% of cases found by screening were in stage 1-2, doubling the detection for early stage disease. Twice as many ovarian cancers were detected with an algorithm than with an arbitrary cutoff of 35 units for CA-125. Overall, the study just missed statistical significance, but a pre-specified subset uh, was of, of prevalent cases showed a 20% reduction in mortality, which was statistically significant. However, you had to screen 641 subjects to prevent one death. These show the mortality curves, uh, where the control group uh, continue, patients continued to do poorly. After about seven years, the curves, however, split with the multimodality CA-125 followed by ultrasound group. Uh, the challenge was that there was very broad statistical bounds around the estimate of a 20% reduction in, in uh, uh, mortality. And so this has not been recommended for routine screening, but later this year with, with additional mortality in each group, those, those data are gonna be reanalyzed and we, we may uh, see a change in the statistics. But regardless of how that turns out, it's clear that you can improve on CA-125 alone. Uh, th this is my, uh, this is my uh, pathology slide. And you can see here uh, with immunohistochemistry staining for CA-125 that some tumors have a great deal of CA-125, uh, some a modest amount, and about 20% have no more than the normal ovary and norm normal ovarian surface epithelium. The, uh, our goal over the years has been to develop a marker panel that detects at least 90% of early stage disease. We slogged through 110 potential biomarkers over that time. It turns out that the addition of HE4 and CA72.4 detect 16% of the cases missed by CA125, but they don't provide lead time. So that if CA125 goes up and these other markers go up, they go up at the same time. A new algorithm is being developed with Steve Skates uh, with CA125, uh, HE4, and CA724. And uh, we have kept the uh, trial uh, going for the NROS so that we can plug in that new algorithm as soon as it's available. Here, Amy, Amy Skubitz, as you're uh, well aware, is using the O-Link ProSeq proximity extension assays with some 92 antigens that can be measured in serum with much as a microliter of serum. 
uh, from 61 late-stage ovarian cancer patients and 88 healthy controls. The interesting thing about o the O-Link is it really permits you to look at down-regulated markers as well as up-regulated markers. And consequently, you've got a lot more potential uh, proteins to choose from. The addition of five biomarkers in AB studies with late-stage disease uh, to CA125 increased the sensitivity from 93% to 98%. Currently, she's analyzing the data for early-stage disease, and we're hopeful that you can come up with at least a few additional biomarkers that will improve on CA125 alone. Germline mutate in women at high risk, there have also been studies to detect early stage uh, disease. Germline mutations of BRCA1 and BRCA2 confer a lifetime of risk of uh, 40 to uh, 6, 45 percent for BRCA1 and 15 to 20 percent for BRCA2 for ovarian cancer, compared to about 1.4 percent in the general population. Given the very high risk, uh, most uh, gynecologic oncologists would recommend a risk-reducing surgery as soon as a woman's completed her family. When surgery is delayed, uh, transvaginal sonography and CA125 are recommended every six months, but there's really no evidence this, uh, this improves survival. And there certainly are anecdotes where women will have a normal CA125 and a, and a normal ultrasound and three months later have widespread intra-abdominal disease. Up to 70% of the BRCA mutated cancers may arise from the fimbria of the fallopian tube rather than the ovary. One of the advances in our understanding of, of the origin of ovarian cancer over the last decade or so has been to realize that high-grade serous cancers that look just like the classical high-grade serous cancers of the ovary actually arise from the fallopian tube. There's a, some debate as to how often that's the case, whether that's all high-grade serous cancers or just a fraction. My own guesstimate is, is, is at least 30%. The problem with this is that as soon, if you've got cancers growing on the fimbria of the fallopian tube, there are no barriers. And as soon as the cell can resist anoecus and survive independent of binding to the cell basement membrane, uh, the uh, metastasis can occur, and sometimes uh, in parallel throughout the peritoneal cavity. And this could be, this could in fact account for the sudden appearance of of, of a, a positive TVS in an elevated CA125 as these metastases grew out uh, in parallel. By and large, annual screening has not been effective. Uh, the ROCA has been applied every three months, uh, followed by TVS to screen uh, more than 4,000 women in the UK who uh, had, had a greater than 10% risk of developing ovarian cancer, most of whom had BRCA1 or BRCA2 germline mutations. 10 of 19 cancers, or 53%, were in stage one or stage two in this study, uh, reflecting a significant stage shift. Now, that should, uh, in fact, translate into some impact on survival, but in this setting, it's virtually impossible and probably not ethical to do a randomized uh, controlled study. So, very small cancers could arise from the fimbria uh, and shed metastatic cancer cells. Uh, it may be impossible to get enough cancer to actually shed enough antigen to change systemic levels of the, of the ligand. Uh, Brown and Palmer some years ago uh, estimated that that transition to stage three occurred when tumors were greater than three centimeters in diameter. Uh, for 50% sensitivity, however, a screening strategy would have to detect 1.3 centimeter tumors. Hori and Gambier also estimated that it would take 2.5 centimeters of tumor uh, to elevate CA125 uh, in the blood. However, judging from the data I've already sh shared with you, as, uh, it, with the NROS and the UK CTOX study, it looked like 40 to 67 percent of cases would could be detected with CA125, so that those, those uh, models may be, may be pessimistic. However, it would be a tremendous advantage to have a biomarker that could amplify the signal from a very small number of tumor cells. And autoantibodies against tumor-associated proteins might provide that kind of bio biomarker. For starters, all high-grade serous cancers have P53 mutations. And at, over the years, there have been a, a dozen reports <coughs> that autoantibodies against P P53 uh, occur in a fraction of those cases. We had worked uh, with three different data sets, one from MD Anderson, uh, one from Australia, uh, and a third from the UK CTOX study, and found that uh, in all three of those sets, 21 to 26 percent 
of the patients would have anti-P53 autoantibodies. For the first time using the UK CTOX studies, we could go back and look at P53 autoantibodies in patients destined to get ovarian cancer sometimes years later. Uh, and with that, we found that uh, in certain cases here uh, in page stage one, stage two, the antibodies against P53 went up much more rapidly than CA125. Uh, taken together, uh, titers of anti-P53 autoantibodies increased eight months before elevation of CA125 and 22 months prior to clinical presentation in patients who did not exhibit increases in serum CA125. This is actually the first of 110 biomarkers that we found that actually go up before CA125 and give you additional lead time. We've looked uh, at the mutations associated with autoantibodies. Uh, a certain number of the mutated sites in P53 are associated with autoantibodies, uh, others are not. And we really can find sites uh, that have antibodies and, and other sites that don't have antibodies, and some sites that both have antibodies or don't have antibodies. So at the present time, uh, inter individual mutations may or may not be associated with anti-P53 uh, uh, autoantibody formation. Currently, we're uh, co co collaborating with the Hogdals uh, in Copenhagen, uh, who have a very large bank and, and the ability to sequence more P53 to see if any of these uh, changes are consistent uh, among different data sets. Uh, we've found so far evidence to suggest that the autoantibodies may be directed against the wild type. We've not proven that formally, but we did develop about a dozen assays against the specifically mutated proteins to see if we could get a more sensitive assay against mutated proteins than against wild type proteins, and we didn't. Uh, so it looks as if the, at least the assays are as good against wild type as against mutated proteins. Also, we have found with the hog dolls that there's a strong correlation uh, with overexpression. As you're aware, uh, P53 goes in tetrads. If one of the P53 mu molecules is mutated, those become more difficult to degrade, and consequently you get overexpression of P53 uh, in the cytoplasm and nucleus of, of cells that have mut mutated P53. It's those cases that have auto autoantibodies, not all of them, but it's fraction. It's very unusual with normal levels of P53 to see uh, autoantibodies. We have only one case. Also, it doesn't appear that there's any correlation between TP53 autoantibody formation and, and other antibody antibodies, such as HE4, and we've, I'll share some data in a minute with you about HE4 antigen antibody complexes. We find no correlation there. We were looking for an autoimmune phenotype. Perhaps some people just make more autoantibodies than others. <laughs> so far, it doesn't look like that's the case. HE4, uh, or whey acidic protein, uh, is human epididymal protein 4, and it was originally discovered by the Hellstroms, who were developing monoclonal antibodies against uh, ovarian cancers and came out with this specificity. Mm -hmm. Subsequently, expression array analysis took this up as dif differentially expressed in ovarian cancer. By and <coughs> large, for screening, HE4 is less sensitive than CA125 for detecting early stage ovarian cancer but it has much better specificity for uh, distinguishing malignant from benign pelvic masses. CA125 will be present in about 20% of patients with benign pelvic masses. Uh, by and large, HE4 has little, if any, uh, activity in that regard. And so that's why both CA125 and HE4 have been in integrated into these tests to detect malignant from benign pelvic masses. Uh, in terms of screening, a combination of CA125 and HE4 detects a slightly greater fraction of early stage cancers than either alone. You can find autoantibodies against HE4, but we found much more prevalent antigen antibody complexes. To uh, study those, we used uh, uh, low pH to dissociate uh, antigen and antibody uh, complexes. Uh, we then uh, put those on spin columns and uh, assayed uh, the eluates to uh, for the presence of freed antibody. And in this setting, about 39% uh, of patients would have elevated antigen antibody complexes for HE4. Uh, and uh, and uh, it, if you look at the combination with CA125, uh, there's about 62% with CA125 alone, but about 80% with the combination. So it looked like there was a significant increment with those. However, we did not see lead time, unlike the P53 autoantibodies. By and large, when these went up, they went up at the same time 
uh, as other biomarkers shortly before the diagnosis of the cancer. We've also looked at the world literature. Rudolf Cax at Heidelberg had done a great review of all the autoantibody studies done to date a couple of years ago. And we looked at the most promising of those, and one of the things we've learned is how difficult it is to repeat the world literature. <laughs> and as it turns out that we found that IL-8 antibodies were elevated, but only in a small fraction of, of ovarian cancer patients. I think the problem here is, isn't that people didn't do the work carefully, but the target protein is so terribly important. If you've got to have the right epitopes to bind the human antibodies. And uh, if, unless you have exactly the same protein supply, uh, it may not work so well. We found also we, we rediscovered uh, osteopontin uh, as, a, as a tumor marker as well and showed that a combination of uh, C125 osteopontin uh, macrophage inhib inhibitory factor and IL-8 autoantibodies detected uh, more cancers than C125 in early stage. We thought with Sam Hanash uh, and Makoto Kobayashi, we've also done some interesting work using mass spec to try to identify proteins. They also had used protein arrays. They used a Fisher protein array that had 5,000 distinct proteins uh, and used sera from ovarian cancer patients and healthy controls and found that, uh, that uh, of the targets that bound the human autoantibodies, uh, the top 25 of those really fell into matrix using Ingenuity uh, software that uh, were in the family of TP53 regulated and MYC regulated proteins. And that fits beautifully with the, what we know of the biology of ovarian cancer where virtually every high grade serous cancer has an abnormality of P53. And about 30% have amplification of MYC, but even those that don't have amplification of MYC uh, actually have uh, elevated MYC activity. Uh, so that th it looks like th this is one of the first pla places we're actually able to explain why people might be getting autoantibodies uh, to, to ovarian cancer. Currently, we're looking, we had worked with Origin several years ago with a much larger protein array of 17,000 proteins. And we've found some 30 candidates that are using sera from the UK CTOX study uh, where we could look at sera for a year ahead of the actual diagnosis of ovarian cancer. We found about 30 candidates. We boiled that down to uh, 12 that uh, look particularly promising. Also, we're collaborating with uh, uh, Karen Anderson at Arizona State uh, and Chuck Drescher at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center, uh, uh, sponsored by the Early Detection Research Network at NCI, to have a bake-off among the different uh, autoantibodies that are out there. Uh, we've, we've identified the, the, the best anti-P53 autoantibody assay, and we're currently looking at about 16 other candidates to see if we could find candidates that would complement CA125 or detect ovarian cancer earlier than CA125. Also, there's been a great deal of work from Hopkins looking at uh, ctDNA, both in blood and in cervical secretions. The cervical secretions sort of make sense in that if anything is shed from the fallopian tube and the fimbria might find their way uh, through the uterus and into the cervix so that you might get an enriched uh, concentration of uh, mutated uh, DNA in that setting. They had reported a couple of years ago uh, at an ovarian cancer conference that the ACR had sponsored that there was a 55% detection of early stage ovarian cancer if you look both at the blood and at the cervical secretions. Uh, and that that complemented CA125. I've not seen this in print yet. There's also another paper where TP53 mutations have been observed in pap smears 20 months prior to diagnosis. So ctDNA deserves further attention for sure. Also, uh, the Kevin Elias at the Brigham and Women's Hospital has looked at microRNAs and using uh, artificial intelligence has identified a panel of those that uh, will again detect early stage disease. Again, with Sam Hanash, we've been collaborating looking at metabolomic markers, uh, driven, particularly those driven by MYC, that are also being evaluated and we'll, we'll be reporting those soon. Also, there's been a, a literature looking at screening for symptomatic women. Uh, Ovarian cancer really isn't a silent killer, though it's sometimes called that. Uh, it's been shown that 89% of early stage disease is associated with new onset of symptoms. The trouble is the symptoms just aren't that specific. They're found in so many other uh, diseases, nausea, diarrhea, constipation, abdominal and pelvic pain, bloating, uh, urinary urgency and frequency. A case control study uh, with some 2,000 participants 
found that a symptom index, taking into account all these symptoms, detected early stage disease in only 0.5% uh, of symptomatic women who had those uh, 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 s s uh, signs and uh, ovarian cancer in less than 1%. However, there's a recent abstract uh, that has not yet found its way into a full paper from the UK, from a group at Cambridge, that suggested there's a 10% incidence of ovarian cancer among 50,000 uh, symptomatic women in the UK uh, with an elevated CE125. So that, that probably need, needs to be revisited. Certainly the other uh, place where uh, innovation is required is in improving the second stage of screening. I went to a conference in the UK about a decade ago, and a radiologist had reported that he'd never seen a normal fallopian tube uh, with ultrasound. Uh, and if you, if you have a large cyst or an ectopic pregnancy in a fallopian tube, that you can see. But certainly the idea of visualizing the fimbria of a fallopian tube is really not realistic. We've been looking at a, a, a new technology that actually is not so new called Superconducting Quantum Interference Detection, or SQUID. This was developed at Sandia Labs in New Mexico some years ago, and it's a very sensitive way to detect and study magnetic fields. It's so sensitive that you can actually pick up the magnetic field around the synapses in the brain, and it's been used as a brain scan. Uh, we've been looking at the possibility uh, of uh, developing nanoparticles of ferritin that uh, can be magnetized. Uh, and that uh, are coated with antibodies that would bind uh, to ovarian cancer cells, like uh, for a model OC125, that I'm sure that there are better antibodies. Uh, if these are simply tumbling around in the bloodstream uh, or in the peritoneal cavity, they uh, do not uh, provide a signal. But if they line up on the surface of an ovarian cancer cell, they reinforce, and if you put a magnetic field uh, a magnetic field through that, as the uh, magnet magnetism uh, decays, uh, that will be delayed, and you can measure that quite precisely. If you coat uh, ovarian cancer cells with these nanoparticles outside the body, you can detect as few as a million cells. Now, if, that, if you could deliver these in a whole uh, mouse or in a person, uh, that means that we could probably improve about 100-fold the sensitivity of detection. This isn't an imaging technique. It would simply tell you, are there abnormal cells that bind uh, antibody against uh, ovarian cancer present or not? And in a patient where the CA125 was going up or the, there were uh, anti-P53 autoantibodies and the uh, ultrasound and perhaps even the CT scans were negative, you could use this test to detect, to decide whether you needed to do a laparoscopic examination. So uh, that's a work in progress. And in a challenge like a lot of nanotechnology is to actually deliver the, the uh, particles without getting stuck in the liver or lung or, or other, other spots. So if the UK CTOC shows a survival mortality advantage when realized, our work with Karen Liu uh, has, has demonstrated that screening is feasible in the United States. Uh, we can use a panel of anti-P53 antibodies, uh, could increase the lead time by eight months improving the ROCA, and presumably a panel of four or five other autoantibodies might really improve substantially on CE125, both in detecting additional cases, but also detecting those cases early. Development of more sensitive imaging and detection methods could detect small amounts of cancer on the ovary or fallopian tube. And again, I think the, the grail here is that the detection of preclinical disease at an earlier stage could improve survival by 10 to 30 percent. And so I think it, with, the, with the UK CTOX trial not having achieved statistical significance overall, there are a fair number of people in the GYN community who say, well, we'll just wait, wait till we really understand it someday a few decades from now. I, I would submit that what we can do is build on where we are at the present time, get more sensitive first stages, more sensitive second stages, and, and move on to trying to develop an effective screening strategy, both for women at conventional risk and, and also for women at, at higher risk. Needless to say, uh, this has been uh, accomplished by a, a, a village. This, this is our village, uh, and the folks who are, who are uh, highlighted in red are, uh, are the people who have actually done the work. Also, we've been very fortunate to receive philanthropic support for a number of these. 
And the Minnesota Ovarian Cancer Alliance has, has helped to support our work there now, fanning out and supporting uh, ovarian cancer research, not, not only in Minnesota, where it's been very important, but, but uh, nationally as well. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much for uh, this very informative talk, Josh. It's so stimulating. Uh, at the microscopic level, uh, we always struggle with uh, borderline tumors uh, resulting in elevated uh, CA125. We don't routinely do IHC, and I sincerely appreciated your IHC slide, but we don't do it, so we don't know if borderline tumor cells would express CA125. We assume they do, but A, they are not particularly interested in spreading outside the ovary. Yes. A and B, uh, size for size, a borderline tumor would have a lot less cells than in yes. cancer. So, uh, but yet we, we can see your data clearly showed that borderline tumors would Resulting in a big disease. Yes. So, what, what are your thoughts about that? Well, I think I think you pointed out all the important points that, that borderline tumors probably have less volume. They st we've we've done immunohistochemistry for those early on, and, and they are they can be CA125 positive. Usually, the mucinous are less frequently CA125 positive than the serous. Uh, they uh, do shed antigen, but but less antigen. And as you saw, we, we missed a couple of borderlines as well as detected a couple of borderlines. So that uh, it probably is not the best biomarker. Uh, and I, I think it, it's one, one of the very, very often in these screening studies, they completely discount borderlines. I'm not sure that's fair. It, it, it's probably worth taking out a borderline just as it is for other ovarian cancers. You can't count on them staying borderline. So, so I think that the, it, it, we still capture those. I guess also we, we do capture with CA125 a certain fraction of mucinous. I think it's sort of ingrained that, that CA125 doesn't detect mucinous cancers at all. Really not the case, but it doesn't detect as many of them. I'd just like to ask, you know how you had mentioned the bit about the size, that it'd have to be three centimeters or two centimeters yeah. or 1.5 centimeters? I was wondering in the cases that you had detected, did you go back and measure uh, the size of some of those tumors? You know, we, we, we have not done that uh, consistently, and it's, it's a great no. point. We, we really need to need to do that. My guess is that probably these were larger, or are as large as 2.5 centimeters, but just hadn't metastasized. Okay. Yeah. I was also wondering, did you look at um, autoantibodies against CA125, or is that something that wouldn't happen because well, it's a normal expressed protein? Dan, Dan Kramer has done that. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. And also there are other groups who are, who are actually, if you treat CA125 enzymatically, you can enhance CA125 activity. Oh, so okay. there, there's some, some interesting quirks. Okay. Okay. Even, I just didn't even, see even CA125. Yeah. 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 How strong is the uh, MRI machine that you were talking about? The, well, it, it's a, the, the, squid, the squid detector uh, it has, to, it has to be in, in liquid helium, oh, <laughs> and, okay. and it's and it, it, it they're they're adapting. Uh, there's a group called Imagion, which is trying to develop a, a detector for that's large enough for people, okay. uh, and that, that but that that uh, too is a work in progress. It it's it's cumbersome. One one of the challenges with mice is that the ovaries in a mouse are pretty close to the liver in a mouse, and in people that's not going to be a problem, but but in, but in mice but in mice this, the uh, the sp spatial uh, constraints are great. Yeah. Sorry, as I said, this is very stimulating. Uh, have you looked into um, the CA125 levels um, related to positive peritoneal washing or not? Because not every ovarian cancer is going to have peritoneal wash, positive washing. But positive wash, washing would, would indicate that cells have shed out yes. of the tumor and therefore CA125 uh, should be uh, elevated more. So, what's the correlation between? Uh, I understand it correlates with stage, yeah. but stage doesn't necessarily uh, indicate positive washings. Yeah, uh, it, really interesting question. I, I don't have data for that. I guess one one point that, that to uh, 
bring out though that's distantly related to that is that inflamed peritoneum uh, gives off CA125. So even though 80% of ovarian cancers express CA125 with stage three and stage four disease, where the peritoneum is involved and, and inflamed, you can see 98% uh, positive for CA125. Well, I, I think I think that this this is something that would have a, at least for first approximations just one um, application, and that's in a patient who's in a screening study where this where the screens don't make sense, where the serum markers are going up, but the imaging is negative. And I think in that's in that setting, uh, if this were positive, if you saw uh, a, sig a convincing signal from one or both ovaries, you do a laparoscopy uh, and, and to see if there was really cancer there. And then you might do some unnecessary surgery with that, but, but hopefully this would catch the earliest stage cancers, even the ones that are on the fimbria. So can you actually laparoscopically see a tumor that is like thousand cells, uh, a million of cells would? Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure you can see a million cells. <laughs> But but this could be this could be uh, uh, probably at the limit of visible visible tumor. Any more questions? Okay. Oh, yeah. okay. I ask a question about the, and I missed the beginning. I'm sorry, but the stick the stick lesions that we we deal with, we don't really know how to tell these patients what to do next. Have they yeah. looked at P53 autoantibodies in patients who have these? You know, yeah, f fa fascinating idea. I, they, they should, a fraction should have autoantibodies, but we've not had, to, had the material to, to study that. Because as you, as you appreciate, uh, one of the earliest changes in the stick lesions is mutation of P53. Yeah. Great. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you.